And now joining us on the communicators this weekend before the election is FCC Commissioner Mignon Clyburn, who uh, after Chairman Janikowski is the senior Democrat on the Federal Communications Commission. Commissioner Clyburn, if we could start with events of the week. Yes. Uh, Hurricane Sandy. Yes. Um, what is your assessment? There have been reports that up to 25% of cell towers in the Northeast have been knocked out, that uh, people are now using pay phones um, in, because their service is not working. Right. What is your assessment of the carriers and their ability to maintain phone service for people in these affected areas? Uh, Peter, first of all, um, allow me to thank you, the both of you, for allowing me to be here uh, today. Um, also, uh, my condolences, of course, go out to the families. Um, there are many loved ones who are lost in this, uh, in this tragic uh, event, and so my condolences go out to them. And of course, uh, a hats off to those brave first responders who uh, answered, continue to answer the call. In terms of the FCC's engagement, as you know, um, the chairman literally spent the night at the agency. Our, our, our public safety person did the same. And we are definitely engaged in the process, have been working um, firsthand with FEMA uh, to make an overall assessment. You are right in terms of those initial numbers, that 25, up to 25 percent of the uh, cell towers were um, uh, disabled during this process. Um, what the FCC does and will continue to do is um, to work with uh, these entities to assess the situation on the ground and to more so um, use this information to see what we could do better going forward. Um, so yes, uh, some of those legacy platforms, we haven't been talking about pay phones in a long time, um, and that just reinforces that uh, in terms of communications engagement, that is an all of the above approach. Uh, very few things are too legacy for use, and um, very uh, few things are uh, un not vulnerable. And so um, there are a lot of lessons uh, learned, and uh, we are engaged to ensure that uh, whatever the best lessons and best practices going forward in terms of redundancy and the like, um, that uh, we will do better next time if there's room to do better. Commissioner Clyburn, is this an improvement over the last natural disaster that we suffered, especially let's, let's look even back to 2005 with Katrina and some other hurricanes and, and natural disasters? I think you happened. will see it, it's too early to make that assessment because, you know, even now, um, things are being ramped up, I think you would say, in, um, in a matter. It's never satisfactory for those out of service. But in terms of, we're going to have vulnerabilities. Um, you know, you, you, when, you, when you have towels, when you, when you have, um, you know, the infrastructure, they're going to be vulnerable um, to natural uh, disasters, uh, of course. But I think all in all, in terms of the response, what I'm hearing and what I'm sensing is uh, people see uh, that um, deployments have been made as soon as uh, it was safe to do so, and that um, a, a lot of the systems worked um, as best as they could under these circumstances. So I think all in all, you will see some improvements uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the results at the end of the day. Well, also joining our conversation on the communicators is Paul Kirby, who is a senior editor with Telecommunications Reports. One of the issues that's come up again this week in light of Sandy is backup power. Yes. A few years ago, the FCC adopted some rules that were challenged in court. Um, at the oral arguments, the just uh, the uh, the two two at least two of the judges on the panel seemed skeptical of the rules, and so the FCC abandoned them. Do you think the FCC should push for backup power rules again in light of? In light of Sandy? I think um, all of these, uh, again, these situations, while uh, tragic, really reinforce uh, why the, some of the pronouncements, some of the things that we put forth, why we do what we do, why we uh, affirm some of those things. Um, yes, backup power systems um, d definitely, uh, you know, were strained and in play here. Um, they're not going to last forever. You mentioned the, you know, the number of hours in play. And so it just affirms how codependent we are and um, how even, um, you know, some people talk about, you know, jurisdiction and the like, that those lines are being constantly blurred. And so I'm hoping uh, that um, even though this was a tragic reinforcement, that that will definitely drive home the need for this type of engagement. And I am hopeful that, uh, that um, this will influence positively um, the, the type of reinforcement, the, re the, st the structure that we need in, in order to to, to bounce back, to be more resilient um, in these times. So you would support a mandate? Would I support a mandate? Yeah. Um, I, I will say that I will uh, review 
Um, and um, I, 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 you, it should not surprise you that I will not make a, a, a pronouncement sure. um, here. Uh, that, uh, but I am supportive of any type of, of reinforced, any type of policy that will ensure uh, not only um, a, a, an ongoing, positive, uh, robust engagement during normal times, but um, the ability to, to ramp up and to reinforce uh, during times of uh, like these. Okay. Um, as Peter said, we're almost on an election here. Um, one of the issues people thought in the telecom circles, if Mitt Romney were to win, some folks think perhaps an FCC run by Republicans and a Justice Department run by Republicans might uh, decide differently in some mergers and acquisitions. Perhaps some firms would, there'd be more mergers in the wireless industry. Does that concern you if, if, if such a thing were to be allowed? Would there be, uh, do you think there'd be less competition if there was more consolidation in the wireless industry? I think there are two things in play here. Number one, in terms of how the staff, how the FCC operates day to day, that will not change. In terms of the, uh, the way in which we evaluate um, you know, mergers, the way in which we digest information, with the way in which staff processes information, that part will not change. I will say that, um, as you mentioned, um, whoever is named head of the um, DOJ, you know, the Justice Department, whoever um, either remains or is named um, head of, of the FCC, uh, of course, will take on, um, will have a lot of the same principles and, um, you know, characteristics as a president. And so in terms of how are things evaluate that may or may not, um, you know, fluctuate, you know, d depending on what happens on Tuesday. But the way in which the FCC governs itself, mm -hmm. in a way in terms of, you know, which we process information, that will never change. But if there was more consolidation, would that, the if more consolidation was approved, would that be a concern, do you think? I am always mindful of what, um, in terms of, of, of any consolidated um, uh, ecosystem or ever more consolidated ecosystem, you know, what that means, mm -hmm. what that means for uh, independent voices, what that means in terms of diversity, what that means for small communities. It really came home to me when I was watching some of the newscast when I saw this individual who I could will say that English was not his first language, who did not know that the, the system was going to shut down at seven. He was stranded. So how, in terms of you know, his information, how does he receive critical information? From my perspective, and this is Mignon Clyburn as an individual speaking, uh, more robust, diverse uh, communications or media infrastructure would, chances are, increase his chances for um, you know, the, in terms of the information dissemination and alike, because um, if he, in this case, he is in tuned or is um, wedded to that particular information source, chances are he's going to go to that information source. Chances are that information source would have disseminated the information. This mm -hmm. individual was stuck. I don't know how long he, but he was stuck mm -hmm. because the information did not get to him. And so that's why, in in, in these cases, I'm concerned about what. Um, a consolidated ecosystem looks like, um, but I am always open for engagement. Commissioner Clyburn, we talked a little bit about the cell phone towers and, and the companies, but what about the first responders? What did you see, what have you assessed so far when it comes to first responders in Hurricane Sandy and their ability to uh, communicate? Uh, what I noticed, a couple of things that were unique about New York. New York has um, a system called PLAN. And I'm, I'm horrible with acronyms, but I think it's personal, whatever, I, I can't remember what the acronym is, but it is a personalized alert, the AS4 uh, alerting um, process that kicked in. And so what I saw, even from that standpoint, was the ability of those um, individuals who had enabled phones, they found out what was going on. So that was an augmented, that was a help uh, to res first responders. In, in terms of, as I said, we work closely with FEMA and other uh, entities to ensure that um, systems and backup systems are in place. Uh, we work closely with radio stations to assume that they need backup power in terms of generators. We, um, we, we kick into gear in terms of the FCC. Um, and so what I am seeing is, uh, again, um, how codependent we are um, and how much that communications backbone, that infrastructure, how much that means, especially in times of crisis. And the FCC, as I said, was all hands on, open 24-7 you know, to ensure that wherever there um, were deficiencies in which we could assist, that we were there. 
Now, uh, Paul brought up uh, uh, politics a little bit, and you've been renominated for a second term by President Obama. Yes. They haven't been confirmed yet by the Senate. This is true. Um, if the president does win, there's been reports that uh, Chairman Janikowski may leave and that you would be appointed acting chairman. I what haven't heard th that. I haven't heard you that. You haven't heard that. Okay, I've got oh, you know, heard some news that. articles. <laughs> <laughs> what I will say to you, Peter, is I am so fortunate to serve. I came from South Carolina, you know, 11 years on that commission, bringing a state perspective to the commission. I will continue to do so if confirmed, and I will uh, continue to serve in any way um, the president and, and the Senate uh, seen, uh, deems fit. Well, if the Senate does confirm you, what are, what are some of the issues that uh, you want to focus on in a second term at the FCC, either uh, in the majority or in the minority? Well, a, a lot of things, um, is, as you know, um, are in play right now. We're very busy in terms of incentive auctions. Uh, a, a authority that we were just granted in, in, in February, this is the first of, the ki of its kind in the world, in which we have an incredible opportunity to uh, make more efficient the, both the broadcast space and the uh, mobile, uh, the cellular space. Uh, in terms of CBAA, in terms of um, ensuring that those with disabilities are um, taking as much, um, have as many opportunities as they can in terms of the communication space by way of, you know, video, um, you know, engagement and by way of um, telephony engagement. Uh, so those are the two things that um, are front and center uh, for, for me right now. Of course, universal service reforms and what that means in terms of broadband adoption and, uh, uh, and uh, in deployment. Those things are, uh, as we laid out in the National Broadband Plan uh, bar back in March of 2010, we laid forth how important it is to ensure that our nation is connected. We've got 19 million individuals in this nation who, regardless of their means, are not, don't have the infrastructure available literally in their backyards to be connected. That is very serious um, uh, to me that has implications by way of, uh, uh, especially in rural America, in terms of uh, rural America being all that it can be, in terms of attracting um, industry and the like, in terms of educating its, uh, its uh, uh, people, in terms of uh, you know, educating as well as providing robust, uh, much needed health care to some of these areas where they might not have uh, specialized care. And so this is so important because to me, uh, broadband connectivity um, is a panacea for so many uh, deficiencies in which we have in this nation, so many opportunities in which we could take advantage of. So broadband, 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 we cannot talk about it enough in terms of connectivity. Now you mentioned incentive auctions. You recently gave a speech in which you, I believe, mentioned the word voluntary about 11 times. Yes. Um, under the law, it's voluntary. <laughs> so you Broad were counting, apparently. I was <laughs> counting. Broadcasters can give their spectrum up, and in exchange, they'll get a share of auction revenues. Right. Um, and then that spectrum will go to wireless carriers. However, what happens, are you, do you have any concern that if enough broadcasters don't agree to give their spectrum up, there won't be enough spectrum, and that wireless carriers will go back to Congress and say, this should be mandatory, it shouldn't be voluntary? Is there, is there any concern that you have? I, no, I do not. Uh, this is a process in terms of this particular uh, incentive auction authority that we take seriously, uh, that we have no plan B, there's a plan A. We're doing all that we can to make sure that the market, that there are market synergies and the market forces, uh, that there are market opportunities uh, that uh, both the buyers and sellers um, can take advantage of. Uh, this is an incredible, unique opportunity for both broadcasters and those in the mobile industry uh, that um, I think increasingly, um, and I can't say voluntary enough, is that 12? Uh, vo voluntary enough because it is a robust and engaged process that is potentially beneficial um, uh, for this nation. It has the opportunity to bring um, more spectrum into play than we've seen in 25 years. Um, so um, I am I'm not concerned. We are doing all that we can to make it all that it uh, can be, and so, and I'm not going to be speculative as to how much, um, you know, it will bring to market, but it has the potential um, to, to really put us on a very uh, firm pathway of meeting the needs of this nation by way of a mobile engagement. But you did say there's been, there's been good interest, at least, from broadcasters so far in that speech. What are you basing that on? 
I'm basing that on uh, the engagement and the questions that are being asked. I'm basing that on the 20 um, uh, po uh, the, the, the 20 engagements that we've had um, by way of webinars. Um, you know, they, there was engagement there. Um, and when you hear concerns being voiced, it is not, it, it, change is very difficult. Uh, so when you hear concerns being voiced, that doesn't necessarily mean a totally negative engagement. That is a group of you know, individuals, a group of business people who are concerned about the way things are progressing. And what we're doing at the FCC is having an open and transparent and a dynamic engagement to ensure that all of the questions, as many questions uh, as we can answer are being addressed in order for this to be a success. Mm -hmm. um, is the process moving quickly enough in your view? Absolutely. Remember, uh, February, we were just granted um, authority in February and April. Um, we laid out a framework as to who would be eligible. In September, we just uh, released um, a, a, a notice of proposed rulemaking that will take up and, and consider all of the technical aspects because this is a, this is a really robust, um, highly technical framework. We've hired outside um, uh, uh, experts. Uh, you know, to help us in this, uh, again, uh, first in the world uh, type engagement. Uh, so um, it's going to be very dynamic as we lead up to 2014. Um, uh, but um, I am confident that um, we have the resources. I am confident um, that uh, the, the team, the internal team that we have is doing everything that it can to ensure that there is an open, robust engagement, uh, that, um, that this is a successful engagement and that we will move more spectrum to market. When we've talked with some of your colleagues, uh, 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 Robert McDowell and mm -hmm. Ajit Pai, they both mentioned that the government has a lot of the spectrum that is being unused and talked about more sharing. Yes. Could you address those issues as well? Please? Well, one of the things that, um, that we say internally, and we say it jokingly, we were very serious, is this, serious about it. Uh, this is a all of the above type strategy. Meaning that when we talk about, like in center boxes that we're talking about, in terms of the engagement, I mentioned 2014 for a reason. It's going to take a while for us um, to, you know, put all the rules of the road to, together to get that in gear for, um, for that engagement to take place. So in the meantime, what do we do to address some of the critical, um, you know, needs that we have by way of, in, in this instance, what's driving um, here, and that's mobile, you know, mobile engagement. Um, every other person we know has a tablet. Uh, most people we know have a, you know, they have smartphones. That uses more energies, you know, you know in terms of more energy than our standard, our, you know, our, our legacy, um, uh, our old way of communicating. Or well, some, uh, I shouldn't say old, uh, the legacy way of uh, communicating, because a lot of us still have landlines. Um, and so in order to meet, you know, these needs, uh, you know, we have to look at um, th the best means and the best way and the timetables uh, in, in terms of you know, deployment or getting that spectrum to market. And so spectrum sharing, uh, looking at um, what the uh, federal, um, uh, what's in the um, you know, federal coffer, so to speak, in terms of, um, of spectrum, you know, all of those things are in play. It's an all of the above approach as to how to get um, spectrum to market. And of course, um, month to month, you follow us. Uh, we do things in terms of and encourage spectral efficiencies in terms of you know the dynamic um, you know spectral um, uh, small cells. You hear a lot about that. All of these things lo are looking at how we can be more efficient in terms of spectrum and how we can get spectrum to market both short and long term. So. To, to drill down a little, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, mm -hmm. in the summer they had a report and they said that sharing with federal government uh, free, uh, agencies should be the norm and that the administration should put out an order ordering those agencies to identify 1,000 megahertz of spectrum to share. Wireless carriers and others say, hold it. The first, uh, the first default should be reassigning spectrum for exclusive use, not sharing. What would you say to those folks? I would say, again, um, that um, everything needs to be on the table and there doesn't need to be a rigid timetable um, as it relates to, you know, whether or not um, this should go first, uh, you know, there should be sharing first or there should be. We, again, um, want to address the critical needs going forward. 
and um, and so it's it's difficult to me. I I, I don't want to uh, go necessarily against any one party or another, but it's difficult for me. Um, and I think it should be difficult for others to be rigid in this process. We need to, again, look at all um, avenues as it relates to getting that much needed, uh, much demand spectrum to market that includes sharing, that in, in includes um, you know repurposing or reallocating, that includes all of it. Um, so I, I, I'm not gonna get into that debate, I'm just gonna say that we need to look at it all and um, in, in order for us to have a, a, a steady stream or steady pathway or a, a steady means to get spectrum to market. Commissioner Clyburn, recently you've been at some ITU meetings. I have. What have you learned? What do you take away from those? That we have more in common than not. That no matter where you head to, or matter, no matter what commissioner you speak to around the world, from the smallest of nations to the most um, developed and more robust, robust of, of nations, you have everybody saying the same thing, that they want affordable, ubiquitous broadband for their nation because they know what it means in terms of economic development. They know what it means in terms of you know, the provisioning, you know, in terms of information exchange. They know what it means. So we have more in common than not. You have, of course, heard about you know, some conflicts. Um, especially as it relates to uh, leading up to uh, what they call the ITRs or looking at um, uh, the, the rules or regulations as it relates to um, the International Telecommunications uh, Union. There are always going to be, you know, the, the conflicts domestically, there are always going, you know, going to be, um, you know, some uh, uh, enhanced, robust, and sometimes tense conversations on, on an international level. But Again, if you speak to the majority of those, those 190 plus nations, they want their countries to be the best that they can be. They want their people to be the best that they can be. And they see, like we do, that uh, a broadband enabled uh, infrastructure will leapfrog, like cellular has done in many developing nations, leapfrog them from where they are now to where they can be. And so, you, again, you hear more um, positive, um, there's a lot of sharing going there, sharing of good pract best practices, sharing of, of good ideas, sharing of resources. So there's more going on by way of uh, sharing and negotiations than, um, than sometimes the headlines reveal. And that's what I see, those commonalities outweigh um, some of those key um, but relatively few uh, frictions you know, that you might see or hear about. Going back to the election, we talked about uh, competition in the wireless market. A couple other things that, that could potentially uh, be in the balance regarding the election would be the special access mm -hmm. rules, which the FCC is trying to change. Um, those basically allow enterprise carriers and others, enterprises and others, to get access to facilities. Right. Uh, the other could be the, the FCC's open internet rules, which are currently under challenge. Regarding special access, if Romney were to win, if a Republican-led FCC were to not want to make changes in the special access rules that some of the smaller providers want and enterprises want, what, what would the impact, do you think, be on competition in the enterprise market? I think sometimes when we use these phrases that we take for granted that everybody knows, you know, when you talk about mm -hmm. special access, what do we mean? We mean, um, you know, those, uh, you know, th those dedicated um, circuits. Um, that many of us use each and every day that we take um, for granted. When you head to that ATM, it doesn't take me long for that engagement, but when you head to the ATM and take your time because you have more money, that exchange is using, that's special access. Um, and so when that um, uh, ATM basically communicates with your bank to see if you can withdraw you know, what you want, th you know, that, that circuitry, um, is the exchange, that's special access. And so to me, um, what you see in terms of that proceeding is you're seeing us looking at how competitive the market is. Um, and, and to me, um, you know, what that means um, and, and what uh, that tells in terms of the future of that particular uh, proceeding um, is, is very telling. Again, we're talking about some basic essential services from your ATM to you know, using that card to go to the gas pump. And so how are the rates and conditions um, you know, fair 
um, those are the types of things, um, questions that I, I trust will be answered, um, you know, regardless of, uh, uh, you know, the, the political makeup um, of the FCC. You've got, um, I feel, um, that um, there's a need for more data uh, and, uh, and, and there's a need for more evaluation as it relates to that because, again, in terms of special access, there are some key essential services um, that could potentially be impacted if um, if all of those variables uh, do not um, are not considered for final decision. But might the conclusions be different if there are three Republicans and two Democrats? I, I, I'm not going to today. I, I can only put forth to you what this commissioner uh, uses in terms of the inputs and variables that this commissioner uh, will use to, to make her decision. And Paul Kirby, time for one more question okay. from the you. The open internet rules are under challenge. Yes. If those are thrown out by the courts, what do you think happens if they're, if they're upheld, do you think there'll be complaints filed of folks saying that open internet rules are being, are being violated? In terms of, I am very, I remain very hopeful in terms of uh, the, the court's engagement as it relates to this. We put forth six high level rules that fit on one sheet of paper that clearly defined for both user as well as even the companies providing the service that these, this is a type of engagement that we should have for a robust um, infrastructure, for a robust exchange, that there should be transparency, that you should know what you're getting um, by way of service, that if I have a device, that I can use my own device if it's not harmful to the market, that if I am trying to access information you know, that's legal, again, legal framework, that I can do that that there is a non-discriminatory um, you know, pathway as it relates to this engagement. Yes, there's uh, you know, re you know, reasonable um, in terms of uh, you know, re reasonable network management principles, but that's transparent too. So what I think and what I know is we use these terms like open internet and network neutrality that sometimes um, get a, uh, many people upset. But what it is is clear rules of the road um, uh, that are, are put forth, so and so there are very few questions about in, in the, um, the engagement. Um, I always say in terms of um, when, when people ask, well, there have been no official filings, I always affirm that this is not an inexpensive space to navigate. In terms of officially filing something, that is an economic, um, uh, it, it's an economic threshold that a lot of people do not have the time or, or the capacity or the economic means uh, to meet. We do hear, I hear every day about challenges, but whether or not those individuals, you know, have the wherewithal, have the means to come and file a formal complaint, that's different. And so as a commissioner, as a regulator, as a public servant, it's up to me to take all of those things into consideration when I make policy. That is why that I'm embracing whatever you want to call it. I used to call it N squared, you know, jokingly. But in terms of our open internet engagement, that is why I have embraced it. That is why I affirm uh, that in principle uh, that, um, that it, has, it worked when it was a, a more informal framework and it will continue to work under the current framework because clear rules are the road are open and are there for us to to take advantage of. And finally, Commissioner Clyburn, uh, there's an election coming up. The holidays are coming up. Lame Duck Congress is coming up. What's the FCC's agenda for the next, for November and December, or will we have to wait for the new year? We continue to work. Um, the, the, we've got certain deadlines as it relates to a CBAA in terms of you know the acts. We've got certain um, deadlines that um, that um, are uh, independent of what you put forth that m might cause everybody else to veer off course. Um, there are some deadlines. There are uh, the critical uh, communications needs um, that uh, must be met. Decisions that uh, must be made that the FCC will continue to do. Um, we'll have a couple of days off for Thanksgiving. We'll have a couple of days off for Christmas and maybe one or two off for the new year. But outside of that, uh, the work continues uh, in terms of serving the American public and, and, and continuing uh, to meet the critical needs of this nation. Do you foresee a hearing on uh, Sandy and its effects? I anticipate that there will, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure if it would be necessarily at the federal level, but I know in terms of um, this, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident, I was a state commissioner, uh, that there will be some assessments 
um, minimally on a state by state um, uh, level. Uh, in terms of, uh, again, looking at um, w uh, what was done and looking at and evaluating and um, making pronouncements as what we can what we can do better. So there will be hearings. I'm not sure if it's going to escalate to the federal level. Mignon Clyburn is one of three Democratic FCC commissioners, and Paul Kirby is a senior editor at Telecommunications Reports. This is The Communicators on C-SPAN.